Today is Friday, December the 23rd. David Faber here with uh, rock star Vicki Sullivan. <laughs> Thanks, David. I, I respond well to flattery. Oh, good. Well, I knew you would. So, <laughs> well, anyway, I, I was just um, I was uh, talking back and forth with Vicki by email here, and she mentioned that uh, she's doing a talk in Austin at the NSA chapter. And it occurred to me that I started to send out an email telling uh, everybody on my mailing list, hey, come see Vicki Sullivan. And then I stopped and was like, well, how the heck are they going to know who you are, right? Because you, yep. you keep a pretty low profile, girl. I try to. Uh, I'm kind of in the back cave doing a lot of market analysis, and I find that I cannot uh, do that analysis and be out and about at the same time. So, well, why yeah. don't you why don't you tell people um, um, share your claim to fame and uh, a little bit about the uh, talk you're going to give at the NSA chapter? And by the way, I'll. Um, uh, look in um, uh, below or someplace in this video, and I'll put links to Vicky's website and also uh, where to sign up for the uh, uh, NSA Austin uh, event she's doing. Oh, fabulous. Thanks so much. I, I really appreciate it, David. Well, my claim to fame is since 1987, I have launched thousands of thought leaders into high fee markets. So at its core, I'm a market strategist. Um, I use market intelligence to brand thought leaders so that they can be a category of one in their respective space. Perfect. And that, that's just the long and short of it. So the call in Austin is going to be about how the marketplace chooses thought leaders. What criteria do buyers use to decide, hey, this person is a thought leader versus this person is just bright, funny, and has great ideas. Right. You know, there, there's a real big distinction right now in the marketplace between those two groups, and people need to understand those distinctions and nuances and how buyers arrive at deciding, you know, we are we are a thought leader. Because right. when you are a thought leader, that's where you get the access to the opportunities that can really take your business to the next level. Cool. And so um, uh, regards uh, to to uh, leadership in a particular category, give your definition of um, uh, platform for people, because we'll probably use that t that word. A platform. Well, platform to me is is basically an idea, a concept. It is something that you rest all your other stuff on. It has to be broad enough to hold a variety of messages, a variety of revenue streams, but it's got to be specific enough that the buyers understand what space you dominate and what they can do with you. Got you. You see, David, a lot of people, I'm going to get on this rant and I'm going to get off. Oh, good. A lot, of, a lot of people are very bright. They have a lot of great ideas. The buyers see their competence. They see the talent. The problem is, is if the buyers don't know what to do with you, then they're not going to use you for anything. Right. They're not going to invite you to speak. They're not going to buy your stuff. They're not going to interact with you. At most, they will follow you. At most, but they're not going to make any move of money exchanging hands or opportunities coming your way because they just simply don't know what to do with you. And that's a major change from, um, you know, from about five years ago. Right. Yeah, the marketplace has changed considerably. Absolutely. And we've now gotten into an age of practicality where if People don't know what to do with you. They just, they'll follow you. They'll sign up and they'll follow you, but they'll be the silent majority right. of your community. They just won't do anything with you. Yeah, I notice uh, a lot of um, who have been thought leaders in the past, um, just to be really rude because I've, uh, I'm going to rail on, on uh, Dan Kennedy about this here in a, a note to him shortly, is that a lot of thought leaders that have, have have missed the progression that you're talking about there and the way they've tried to recover is they send out like one or two or three email a day trying to inundate this great mass of people that uh, to move them in some way instead of throttling down to once a week or once a month and giving something that's high quality content. Well, let me just bounce off that for a second. Here's my theory. I think uh, when people can't come up with compelling content or original content, what they do is they just throw crap on the wall and see what sticks. <laughs> yeah, they so, go for quantity instead of quality. Exactly. And so if you just keep throwing stuff out there, it, it only 
it only helps people reinforce the idea that you're smart, but we don't know what to do with you. Exactly. So and that's if, no good. If no. you're smart and, and nobody gives you any money, you're eventually you're going to be living under a bridge in a box with a leash on a cat. Absolutely. And this is what I call fame without fortune. It, there you go. You know, you, you've got the spotlight, people like you, you have a following, you got bragging rights because you can say, oh, I've got this many people in my database. But if they don't make a move, who cares? Right. You know, and that's the problem. It, you know, you've got to be able to have buyers buy from you. And that's the key difference between smart people with good ideas and thought leaders. When, when a buyer decides you're a thought leader, they're looking for ways to give you money. They are looking for ways to interact with you because they know what to do with you. They're just trying to find a format for it. And then that and the format's easy. Format's right. easy. And, uh, you know, because there's so many opportunities to, to interact. But with, but with the smart people with good ideas, they'll follow them because they find them entertaining, they find them interesting, but they're not going to do anything. Right. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, like one of the things that a lot of us have um, done for years and years is, is speak. You know, uh -huh. physically speak with groups, and in the IM space, uh, the internet marketing space, there's this. Uh, over the last decade, there's been this huge uh, attempt on people's part to just spew out reams and reams of long copy, long format copy to generate a sales in a one step process instead of speaking with people, forming a relationship, going on and on to move towards not one sale, but a whole lifetime relationship. Yeah, let's take that one step further. Yeah, I was going to ask for you to talk a little bit about how you specifically counsel people to do relationship building with their community or tribe. Well, I think the first thing you got to do is you don't show how smart you are. You show what you have and how people can use it. And the scope of of your of your content has to be more and more narrow, but at the same time, you've got to have an overall focal point or set of rules. And let me give you an example. One of my favorite example is uh, Susie Orman, the right. the financial guru. What she did back in the day is she owned the emotional side of money space. Right. So she didn't carve out she she carved out her niche within the big the big territory of financial advice and financial issues. And what she did is she redefined the journey, she redefined the motivation about why we spend the money we spend. Mm -hmm. It's emotional based. Now, this is old hat now, but back at the time that she launched this, this was new. Yeah, she was the first one uh, to, to start that path. Absolutely. And look at her rules. Her rules are, and, and there's at least the two of them that come to my mind, is uh, people before money and money before things right and so people knew what to do with that okay so so what she did is she did two things that i counsel everyone to do number one you've got to identify your space you can't say i'm a financial person or i'm a financial person for women you know that's that's way too crowded you have to stake your claim and say this is this is my point of view this is my voice this is my approach okay right. secondly you've got to have something for people to hang their hat on so that you can be memorable Memorable. So she's the emotional side of, of money. That's the hook. Okay, that's what gets people interested. But when she says people before money, money before things, that gives people a North Star that they can do something with. And that's what makes them give her money. Yeah, I call that the Polaris effect, the North Star effect, yeah. Exactly. So now they know what she's about, and what she says to the marketplace, basically, is if you don't believe those two things, if you don't believe the emotional side of money, I'm not your girl. Well, it's interesting how Susie and uh, Clark Howard is really good about this, too. Both uh, uh, Susie Orman and Clark Howard are very practical-based, too. It's no theory about, you know, someday, blah, 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 blah. It's, you know, if you're here today, here's the first step you take to make a change. 
Absolutely. And you'll notice that her books cover a wide range of issues, but they stay within that platform. Right. They stay within the space of the emotional side of money, and they stay within those broad rules. So she's given herself pretty wide berth. I mean, it's it's really an example of a great platform. As we were saying, it holds a wide variety of messages, but at the same time, it's specific enough that people know what to do with her. Cool. Oh, I think that gives a great overview. Yeah. And so and the good news about this, David, is that there there are some ingredients that you can develop. There are some things that you can do right away that what she built can be built. OK, if people can do this if they know what to do. And that's exactly what we're going to cover at the NSA thing next month. Well, yeah. That, in fact, let's uh, let's uh, switch gears a little bit about uh, from your claim to fame to um, we'll start with talking about maybe give maybe th- uh, two or three specific things people can take away from the the uh, Austin gig you're doing, and then let's do a resource uh, roadmap or resource walk through your um, uh, products and tell people how. Boy, this is a shameless plug for your stuff. <laughs> Uh, tell people because I mean you've got a you know a pretty vast portfolio of, of products and let's walk through how people maybe get started wandering through your products and using them in the specific sequence that best serves like a, a beginner and maybe also a pro absolutely cool. let's talk about NSA Austin first here's a couple of things that people are going to walk away with the first thing they're going to walk away with is they're going to know how buyers decide who's a thought leader and who isn't and that's going to be a benchmark that they can compare themselves to that's going to be a benchmark that they can outline what they need to change in order to be seen as a thought leader in the marketplace and if they're already seen as a thought leader of a, uh, in the marketplace this will help them be seen as a high end thought leader in the marketplace cool okay so that's the first thing that they're going to learn the second thing they're going to learn is they're going to learn what are some of the key ingredients what do they have to have in order to create that and that again is going to be benchmarks where they're going to be able to say to themselves okay i have that i have that oh i don't have that that's what my focus is for 2012 so they're going to be able to map out what they need to do in order to create that for themselves and yes it will be different for everybody because it, you, it, different people have different things already at, uh, on hand. And then, and this is where it's going to get really fun, we're going to play with some specific tools, formulas, and processes that I have developed from scratch based upon market analysis and market intelligence of how buyers choose thought leaders. We're going to play with those processes so that every single person in that audience can walk away with something specific that they can use for themselves, specifically for them, the next day so so if i'm going to sum it up it's number one how to be a thought leader number two uh thought leader design checklist number three the tools formulas and processes uh required for you to design your whole thought leader gravity well or marketing funnel however you design that absolutely well what you're going to leave with is you're going to leave with the rudiments of a platform now david let's get real here if you don't participate you ain't gonna get any of this stuff yep Okay, so you got to show up and you got to be ready to ride. All right. I mean, you, you, you got to show up, suit up, show up and, and come with an open mind and open heart. <laughs> but if you if you if you do that and you and you play to win, that's what you're going to get. You know, you're reminding me of something interesting here. Somebody uh, in a recent uh, talk I was getting asked me how to become a good writer and speaker. And I said, well, that's easy. You write a thousand articles and speak in front of a thousand audiences and you'll be good. Yep. However, the, the before that, it's really good to have designed your platform specifically. Yep. Because you can, I mean, I, you know, when I started, I didn't have any tools and I just made it up as I went along. And it took Mm -hmm. a decade to figure out how I was going to silo my platform into different keynotes and topics. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you're, so if you're a beginning speaker, especially, I think uh, for beginning speakers, this would be good to shave off your startup bootstrap time. And then for pros, maybe to hone or refine your monetization and uh, bump up your uh, overall cash flow. 
absolutely. In fact, my clients report that when they work with me one-on-one, I shave between two and four years off their curve. Cool. Yeah. Even in this economy, I had uh, one client back in uh, 08, 09, increase her revenue by 67%. Um, Her close ratio just soared after working with me. And I had one client just this year back in the fall make his entire fee that he paid me back before the project ever ended. So he got his investment back plus maybe 20% more, which may, when you amortize that out, anything he gets after that's pure profit. Cool. So uh, let's, uh, let's take people on a, uh, uh, a resource walk through your um, portfolio here. Sure. Um, my portfolio is, is very deliberate. And so it, it really is depending on where you're at, where are you at, and what you need. So now, what's, a, what's a starting product or a, maybe a starting roadmap for a new speaker then walking through your products? Uh, the get those bookings and uh, get those bookings and speaking in the strike zone is path fabulous for beginners and those are you know those products are thirty five dollars or you can pick up speak to sell along with it for you know the ninety dollar the speaking success kit and that's absolutely that's a steal absolutely well yeah especially when you look at all the systems that are in there i mean get those bookings is really kind of an overview of the market and i just listened to that the other day because i was concerned about you know with it with the market changing is it it still yeah (laughs) and and i listened to it and i'm like oh my god this you know this is deja vu all over again you know the market you know the decisions have moved up the food chain uh committees are getting kind of crazy they're still crazy you know you know it, it's still very very relevant and speak to sell i'm excited about because there's a lot of folks out there that speak to get clients their business model is i make enough on the back end that i'm willing to forego a fee or reduce my fee you know by a significant amount in order to get in front of the audience yeah well, that's, me- that, that's my specific approach that i teach people is if you've got a big enough back end you can trounce everybody on the front end by speaking for free <laughs> absolutely and here's the thing though david is the secret to that is what you do before the speech not during the speech exactly too many people think they just need to make the best speech they can make yeah. and they're going to get all this money and you know, it's not like that anymore people yeah. especially now i was just talking to someone the other day about you know the whole boot camp market and they're like you know what people are sick of being sold mm-hmm. they're sick of the emotional manipulations they're sick of being told that they're a loser if they don't buy this stuff yeah and it's it's really backlashing now and my system doesn't even is not even close to that approach there's no emotional manipulation there's none of this hey you're you're a loser if you don't do this kind of stuff. It's more of a seduction. It's more enticing than than going to the dark side and, and making people feel bad. Yeah, and I'd, I'd even go one step farther with um, all the recordings I've heard of yours is that rather than uh, even seducing or influencing, yours is more of inspiring. Oh, thanks. Right. I mean, because if you if you figure out how to be a thought leader, you don't have to sell. It's just done. Oh, it is. And when you look at the major thought leaders in the marketplace, I mean, the people that make forty to $60,000 a speech, you know what their day is about? Their day is about fielding the invitations. They don't even go out and get them anymore. They just come to them. Right. You know, they're kind of like, I call it the Donald Trump factor. You know, they're just sitting around and the phone's ringing and all they're doing is answering the phone. Yep. You know, that that's it. And that's the power of being a high-end thought leader. People want to work with you they feel like they have to work with you and then all you're working out is details and the details are easy when both people want to do something well we'll we'll have another conversation offline but one of the other things that i tell people how to do is uh in any city in the 
that a person goes to in the country to speak, it's very easy to fill a room in a specific city by using social media and in uh-huh. a very specific way, not uh-huh. like anybody else I've ever heard. Yep. But that's one of the other things I tell people is when you go to speak someplace, you be responsible for filling your room, period. Oh, yeah. I call it pack in the house. And you we betcha. talk a lot about that in, in Speak to Sell. You don't depend on just anybody showing up. No. You get more deliberate about it. And you don't even depend on your host or the organization yeah. that's no. yeah, and you take it upon yourself to pack your own room and you'll always clean up well yeah and also because if you're packing the room full of decision makers and you mix them in with your current happy clients you would be surprised the buzz you get perfect remind me at the end of this call after we click the recorder off i'm gonna uh, i'm gonna walk you through like a three-minute overview of how i fill rooms in cities you'll love oh, it okay I'd love to hear it. Um, so let's, so uh, d- uh, while we're still on this topic, um, why don't you cover also, well, first off, get get those bookings, speaking in the strike zone and speak to sell. How long are those? Are those single audios? Yeah, those are single audios. And, 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 and we have a password protected section of my website that has even more information on it. Cool. Well, so, so one of the things I might do um, is I might, um, since I've got copies of this, maybe I'll hold some uh uh, groups to get people prepped for you. You're, you're actually going to be in Austin, right? Yep, I'm going to be at in Austin North. on January the 10th. All right, so maybe what I'll do is do some sort of random. What If, if uh, a group of new speakers was going to go through uh, one of your products, which is the absolute best product to start with? I try speaking in the strike zone. Okay. Well, so maybe I, I'll uh, track that uh, maybe a week before you're here to get people all prepped up for you. Oh, that's so kind. Thanks so much. Cool. So talk a little bit also about uh, your, um, well, let's let's do the the sort of the, 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 uh, the next rung of products you've got, the turbocharged business model toolkit and also turbocharged strategy toolkit. Yeah. These are for people that are already in the biz, they're already in the marketplace, or they're successful in another area and they're about to get into the market, the expert marketplace. And what we do on a uh, strategy toolkit as I've noticed a lot of people have great ideas but they have no idea what's feasible and what's not feasible oh okay? good good point and and you know what happens is is you get this brilliant idea you get real passion about it anyone that even acts like uh, anything less than a cheerleader you call them a naysayer which is kind of stupid I mean they're just trying to help you but you know this this little thing for $159 you can measure the market feasibility of your idea and you can decide whether this idea is worth it See, that's the question. I'm going to get on this rant, Dave, and I'm going to get off. This is the question people never ask and they need to. And and CEOs of established companies ask this all the time. But, you know, when we become our own boss, we don't do this. And that is this. Is this idea worth it? Is it worthy of my time? Is it worthy of my effort? Just because it's a great idea doesn't mean it's worth six months of your blood, sweat, and tears. Yep. You got to decide that. And so that's what the strategy toolkit is about. Now, the business model toolkit, these are for people that want to get into the business, but they've got some options of how they make their money. And they're thinking, well, do I want to do this business model? Do I want to do that business model? First off, experts don't look at their business model. And so what happens is, is their brand and their business model will be such a huge mismatch that the market just blows them off. Okay? <laughs> That's a I'm good telling, point. Oh, it is. It's horrible. Because what happens is I get, you know, hundreds of calls and emails a month. I will get people that say, well, here's my website. And I'll come back to them and say, okay, I'm on your website. Here's how you've positioned yourself here's your business model that your website is telegraphing and there'll be dead silence on the other end because that's not what they intended right so their brand and their business model if those two things are not aligned game over well and it's important um to keep in mind that that's like peeling an onion that it evolves over time too so every once in a while you've just got to retool everything Oh, my gosh, yeah. Or you're stagnant. Yep. You know, That's got, one of the processes I'm going through is I'm about to re-release all my websites in a, you know, all at once because 
um, you know, the the content I've got up is uh, the format and structure is 10 years old. Well, and you know what? Here's what I find, uh, David. You know, I will, I'll get stuck in this, well, it's good enough mode, right? Yep. So, I mean, I wasn't changing my website for right. the longest time. It was good enough. I was getting clients, blah, blah, blah. Well, then one year I was up for an appointment at Harvard University at the Kennedy School of Government. And all of a sudden, my website mattered. OK, mm. I, I mean, you want to talk about something going to the front burner real quick. Yep. That go. website got redesigned in a heartbeat. Cool. And sometimes it but you don't want to be in that position. You don't want to be in a position where something happens. You're you're in line for a fabulous opportunity, which, by the way, I dodged a bullet. I got the appointment. I've had a blast with that group ever since. And so you don't want to be in a position where you have a situation where you're about to lose something because something's not up to date. Exactly. And that happens more often than, than not a lot of times. So that's what these two things are about. Now, when you look up and you look at talking to strangers, this is for people who are using those um, those matching services, you know, where someone feeds you leads of meeting planners, or if you're really reaching out, you know, sometimes people will say, you know, I've gotten to this level of my business through referrals and networking, and now I've got to talk to people who don't know me very well. Right. Okay. That's what talking to strangers is all about. It gets you to that next level because I tell people all the time, they'll grow their business to a certain point and then past that point, they're going to have to compete in what I call the open market. Mm -hmm. And that's when the buyers have a lot of options. And if you can't compete in that market, your business is not going to grow past the point it is right now. Right. And so this is for the intermediate people that want to grow past the referrals and networking. All right. And then you've got your position of power. That is for people who either need to refine their brand or they're start, they want to start off strong. So there's again, they're successful in another area. They want to make sure their uh, expertise is packaged in a certain way. And so they'll start off. They'll start off with that so that they can shock and awe the market and be seen as a thought leader immediately. Excellent. So now let's move on up to your flagship products and talk about uh, sponsor savvy and springboard marketing. Sponsor savvy is for the the elite expert. Okay, and I'll tell you why. Because sponsorship is becoming the number one way a lot of experts are being paid to speak. Yeah, and this is this is some serious sort of G two secret agent stuff here. I mean, if you understand this, you yep. can just clean up over everyone else. Absolutely. And what I found in the market is a lot of people were talking about how they got sponsorship deals, but that doesn't necessarily translate into how anyone can get sponsorship deals. Right. So this sponsor savvy, now it's heavy, okay? It's it's in depth. The feedback that I've gotten from folks is and I've gotten this feedback from several of the programs where they're like, Vicky, I gotta listen to these CDs like three or four times. Okay. <laughs> this is this is not fluffy fluff. Okay. We're we're doing deep dives. We're drilling down. It's it's not uh, fluffy fluff. It's not one of these dang, oh, here's some principles crap. Okay, we're not doing any of that. These are process oriented. This is the deal, folks. We're deep diving. And you got to come up for air. So, especially with sponsor savvy. And again, if you suit up and show up and you, and you, and you do the processes, you'll be surprised what you get. I mean, I doubled someone's sponsorship fee within an hour using Good. these processes oh yeah and and she was shocked and i was doing a happy dance i mean we're all happy so this is very heavy duty for the elite people people above five to seventy five hundred dollars a speech usually find their fees both in the corporate and the special event market to be sponsored okay and in fact in the association market I'd say 75% to 85% of the speakers are sponsored. Associations aren't even paying speakers anymore. Right. That, so, that, and that's that's right on the money. Yeah. So you've got to be able to play that game or you're just going to be shut out. You're just going to be completely shut out. Springboard marketing. Springboard marketing is all about leverage. It is about this is my big 
Kahuna product. I mean, I think the I think the the manual alone is like almost a hundred some odd pages. I don't even know how many pages. That's crazy, but it is about soup to nuts. How do you figure out the strategic things you got to figure out? How do you come up with killer content? How do you come up with the killer speech topic? How do you come up with the signature style? You know. David, there's a difference between uh, being a good communicator, being an articulate communicator, online, offline, in speeches, in social media, and having a signature style. You know, you, you know, having that signature style is so important. Um, I call it sharpening your edges. Instead of trying to be blasé and like everyone else and being socially acceptable, sharpen your edges. Exactly. And and you know, the market is not real good with obnoxious right now. I mean, there's a little bit of a boomerang effect around. Yep. You know, rebel without a cause, so to pe- so to speak. But if you can be, if you can tell hard truths in a warm and approachable way, using mm. your own strengths, and that's the key, using your own strengths and injecting humor some way, so you can um, help people have a little sugar with every bitter pill. Absolutely, and you know the poster child for that. If you stop and think about it, is really Dr. Phil. Yep. You know, when Dr. Phil was on Oprah, he could be really hard edged because Oprah was his counterbalance. Mm-hmm. And when he went out on his own, he had to really soften up. He didn't soften up the truth. What he did is he added more humor. And when he added more humor, it kind of let people up off the hot seat enough that they didn't they weren't sympathetic to the idiots. You know right. what I'm saying? So so if you attack someone so strongly, the marketplace will have sympathy because the attack is so harsh. So what he did is he didn't dilute the truth. Okay, he didn't do that. What he did is he added to the truth. And that's what's made his television show, in my opinion, so successful. Right. So you've got to add your signature style. You really do. You you got to add it. He couldn't get too warm and fluffy because that's not his strength. That would have diluted the truth, and that would have he would have sank like a rock. Well, and he would have gone against his true nature too. Exactly, and that's another thing, David. The marketplace can spot inauthenticity at fifty paces. Yep. If you even show up one iota as something that you're not, you're already dead in the water. Exactly. I mean, the marketplace just ignores you. You get dead silence, you know. And, and you know, David, it's really hard to interpret dead silence, you know. <laughs> I mean, how do you interpret it? You know, I mean, th- there's no feedback on what you've done wrong. People just ignore you, yep. you know. And so that's what I'm really excited about at NSA Aust- Austin is that if people are not getting the market traction that they really want, the marketplace doesn't send them a memo on why. Right. And and I'm hoping that my presentation will answer that why question for folks. Well, and, and that's this is a really, really important um, thing for speakers to understand uh, about live speeches is that if you're doing webinars or podcasts or anything where your entire audience is remote, you never have any tactile, energetic feedback. If you speak, yep. if you speak live, you can test your material, and if the room goes, you know, glazes over, you know, well, that's out. Get Absolutely. rid of that out of your speech. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, and that's what's so great about about speaking. And I and I learned this when I I, I just finished teaching in China to a group of uh, business owners. We were teaching uh, market strategy and branding to mm. uh, CEOs, and. You learn exponentially after that first time. Oh, yeah. You know, because it, it was my first time to being interpreted. And I learned very quickly when I had to stop so the interpreter could come in. Well, and, and you also learned to get rid of all the colloquialisms and odd humor artifacts out of your speech. <laughs> absolutely. And, oh, yeah. You got it. You don't you don't have to play it straight because but you can you can touch upon the human condition mm-hmm. that everyone else can relate to. And another thing that you learn is, you know, because I did some market analysis into some brand campaigns in China and some very interesting market dynamics are going on over there. And by speaking to that, you know, that was a really major big hit. But I had no idea how that was going to play out until I did it. Interesting. 
Yeah. And you bring up a great point, too, is you you never know what's going to happen until you, you know, what you said a minute ago, suit up, show up, sink or swim, right? Exactly. And and you learn exponentially. I mean, they're, they're the best teacher is experience. Yep. Now, the problem is, to go into the dark side for a second, if you use that adage and you don't get any kind of instruction or you don't understand what's going on in the marketplace, you can be very quickly branded by default. Yep. And I was just talking to someone about this the other day. You know, it's better that the market have a blank page on you where they will, the buyers will give you the benefit of the doubt until you prove them otherwise. And, but if you cheap out on stuff, like if you cheap out on your, your, your demo video or you cheap out on your marketing tools, you cheap out on strategy, what happens is, is the market forms an opinion about you and now you've got to be in that position of weakness. You've got to re-educate the marketplace in order to get any kind of traction. Right. So what I find the biggest mistake a lot of experts make is they use the wrong criteria on how they get help. And I just had someone the other day say this to me, and I said, you know, just human being to human being, I've got to tell you this. People will say, oh, this person's local, they're cheap, I feel comfortable with this price point, I'm going to hire them. You don't do that. What you do is you say, what do I need, and can this person provide what I need? And too many people are cheaping out in this industry, and it's really killing them. I mean, it, it, it's, it's just, it's cutting off their nose to spite their face. Yeah, I mean, it's to a point now where you, I mean, if, if you're going to have people take time out of their day to um, either show up physically or even show up on a teleseminar or webinar, you have to provide high value. Yep. I, oh, yeah. Just the price of attention has increased exponentially. Yeah. I mean, it, it, even if it's I mean, some people think that um, if they offer something for free, they can get away with anything. Uh, well, those it, days are gone. Those days are gone. And in, in fact, free is is now an integral part of an entire uh, marketing gravity well that draws people through from price point to price point and makes them a lifetime customer. And if you well, mess if up you that it, free right? component, you mess up your whole intake for your entire business. Absolutely, David. But you got to do it right. Oh, See, yeah. And if you throw stuff on the wall, that's when that's the dark side of free, my friend. <laughs> the dark side of free. <laughs> I mean, it's just I mean, people think it is exactly to your point. They'll say, well, it's free. I can say anything I want. And then they pontificate. I'm like, get off your soapbox, dude. You know, say something worth saying. Yep. Well, in fact, uh, and also make sure that um, you're, you know, what what you're speaking about is it's uh, narrow in focus, it's relevant, it's unique, and it's also actionable. Yes. Because, yes. I mean, we're kind of, I mean, I love, I love like Jim, Jim Rohn's um, uh, philosophy, except we, we have moved out of business philosophy. You still require to have that. It's great. And we're in a, a, a time in our economy where people require actionable items to have positive effect on their bank account. Yeah. In fact, but here's the thing, though, David, philosophy is free now. Oh, yeah. That's the thing. Philosophy is free. And so, yeah, you need it. Here's what I'm telling clients. You need to have an approach with a twist. And I'm going to be talking more about this in Austin. Oh, good. You need an approach with a twist that lures people into your solution. Because here's the problem. If you go in with a collection of tactics, the buyers assume that once they have your tactics, that they know everything you know, and they discard you like trash. Mm, yep. So you can't leave lead with just a bunch of tactics you have to have again using Susie Orman as an example you have to have that overall approach so that people keep coming back for more and more and more right so you have to have a balance and I'd say you know because of the economy the balance has shifted 25 75 25 on approach and then 75 on practicality but the reason why you have to have the approach first is that people have to agree with you and your approach before they're ever going to try anything with you. Right. You've got to start out a little bit with the philosophy and strategy to give people an idea of if they qualify to work with you, if there's a match. Exactly. And here's another trick of the trade, David, that I can't wait to talk to people about in, <laughs> in the NSA. I am so excited about this, is we are now in the age of interpretation. 
So instead of just saying to people, hey, we got a problem, you have to interpret and diagnose that problem in a different way. That establishes your approach. Yeah, that that's the unique, um, that's how we created our radical health business is we took, um, you know, s- people's health symptoms, for example, and translated them usually in a 180 degree uh, translation or interpretation that allowed people a set of experiments they could run. And usually one of those experiments would clear their symptom. There you and go. That's, that's a powerful way to create a platform. It's kind of like uh, very similar to maybe the Dr. Phil approach where he, you know, says, well, you know, how's that working for you? Uh huh. And if it ain't working, then you, you keep doing the same thing and get the same result and that ain't no good. <laughs> Absolutely. And what happens is, is I think people do that by default. And what you're doing, just to use you as an example, is you're hooking them in with the with the approach and then you're then you're knocking them out with the result, which keeps them coming back. Yeah. And you have to do that over and over. It's it's not a one time thing where oh, you yeah, yeah. where you go through that process of attracting and then somehow you sell stuff after that. It's a constant attract, offer, attract, offer, attract attract offer over and over and over again. Right, exactly. And, you know, I saw this up close and personal just the other day. I got an email coming in of someone that wanted me to speak to their group. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, I've already spoken to your group. And she goes, yes, you spoke to our group two years ago and people are still talking about it. So we need an update. That's when you know you've caught somebody. Hmm. Gotcha. That's the kind of feedback you want to hear. So you got to listen, you know, and it, and this is also a great point about assumptions. I assume that once I've spoken to a group, they're good to go moving on. But one of the lessons I've learned in my business is that sometimes people need an update. Right. And if you've done a good job setting the approach, then they do want to hear what else is happening in the marketplace because people know the market's changed. They just don't know what to do with the changes. And well that's said. what we're going to be covering in, in, in NSA, and that's why I'm so excited. I mean, we're going to be covering like two to three hours. This is going to be a drill down. Excellent. Well, so um, if um, I'm sure that some people uh, who are listening to this will um, be inspired to uh, work with you uh, directly one on one. So a couple of questions. Uh, first off, are you taking new clients and what should people do to prepare before they come and pitch you uh, to work with you? You know, I'm so glad you brought that up, David, because I've got a secret to share. Okay. okay. You ready for this? I First off, I work on projects only, okay? Yep. Um, the reason why is that I don't want to be constrained about the time that it takes me to analyze the market on someone's ha- behalf. I want to do what I have to do in order to create the product that and the findings that's going to take someone to the next level. But here's what people don't know about me. When I speak at an event, I know that the audience is going to have questions. And so I open up my calendar. I purposely stay the day after and I will I will work with people one on one for an hour for an hourly rate. And it's a killer hour, hourly rate. It is Are you open to sharing that on the line or would you prefer to do that in the room? I would prefer to do that in the room. Gotcha. But I will tell you this. My relationships start at $10,000. I will not touch anybody for less than $10,000. And the reason for that is my track record. I mean, when I generate hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars for people, that I get what I get. Um, but my hourly rate is low um yeah i'd say maybe mid to low three figures now you're going to pay hundreds of dollars but you're not going to pay more than five hundred dollars so you got five hundred dollars less than five hundred dollars on one side you got a ten thousand dollars on the other side well and that's specifically while you're in town in a specific place exactly and there's only four or five slots open Cool. And when they're gone, they're gone, and we shut her down. And uh, what should people do to prepare um, for if they're going to take um, advantage of an opportunity like that? What should they do to prepare beforehand? 
Well, they need to do two things. Okay. They need to come to the event so they can get the systems. Um, then what they want to do is they want to look at the questions that they're having that are keeping them from implementing the systems. What people do during this one hour is they usually take the exercises because we're going to go through these exercises. They're going to say, okay, here's what I came up with. What do you think? Okay. So they usually want direct feedback about the work they've done so they can refine it. Or what they'll do is they'll say, here's my URL. Look it up. And I want to talk about how this positions me and what do I need to do to change my positioning. So I will do just a little bit of pre-work before every hourly consult, which just extends the value because when that hour starts, I hit the ground running. Gotcha. And I, you'd be surprised the territory we can cover in an hour. I mean, it's it's crazy. And what I also tell people to do, because as you can tell, I talk real fast, bring a recorder. Yeah, that's what I tell people anytime, you know, anytime you go for a consult like this, um, make sure you take uh, pen, paper, and recorder. Yep, because I'm telling you, it's going to get wild, woolly, and you want to be present. All right. Cool. Are there, uh, is there anything else? Uh, man, we've covered a huge amount of territory. Is there anything else that um, you'd like to pass along as a wrap-up for this uh, talk? Uh, you know, I just want to tell people that there are opportunities in the marketplace you know it, it things look a little grim sometimes there are uh, the latest studies have just come out the data fresh off of uh, summer 2011 so the data is pretty pretty fresh meetings and opportunities to speak are increasing for 2012 however budgets and attendance are going down yep so it's going to be a fight for the budget you can get your fair share. There are people paying fifteen, twenty-five thousand dollars for speakers. They're just paying for different speakers. So the money is out there, the opportunities are out there, but you're gonna have to be smart and you're going to have to outsmart the competition to get those opportunities. Well, and you bring up a really important point about uh, events are up and fees attendance down. So what that means is as fees go down, you better make sure you've got a back end. And as attendance goes down, you better sh be sure that you've got the technology to pack your rooms. Exactly. You're going to have to make it work because right now buyers are really focused on doing more for less. Now, here's the exception to that. OK, here's the deep, dark secret that people don't talk about. Yes, folks have a budget. However, the, the people making choices about experts, either in coaching, consulting, speaking, buying stuff, all that, that's moved up the food chain. And the higher the, the organi organization chart you go, the more fluid the budget. So if they want you mm. bad enough, they're going to move stuff around to get you. You just have to show that you're worthy of that moving around. So what's happening is you've got a polarized market out there, David, where you've got a lot of what I call false buyers, people who have the power to say no, but not the power to say yes. Right. Or the or, or they have the power to say no, uh, uh, yes and no, but had no power of budget. Exactly. So they'll say, because what will happen is the people who really make the decision, they'll give it to an underling, some 20-something that's got more energy than I'll, I'll ever have in my life. And they'll say, look, find a speaker and you can only pay two bags of beans. All right. Well, that person's hair's on fire. You know, again, they're 20-something. They want to do good. So they're going to be running around trying to find a speaker that'll work for $2.50. Ouch. You know what I'm saying? Yep. But if you can get to that buyer who controls the budget, what happens is, is the buyer will go to that 20-something and say, look, I've selected the speaker, handle the details. Yep. Well, and this still goes back, I keep harping on this over and over, is you be in charge of your back end and uh, cheeks and seats. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. You be, I mean, you cannot leave anything to chance in this market. It's just too volatile. Yeah. I, I, the, I, I only, I only gamble on sure things. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Absolutely. anything else you'd like to add, Vicki? You know, just that I'm real excited about coming to Austin in January and I hope, uh, I hope to see your, your tribe there. Excellent. Well, thanks for taking time out today, Vicki. You got it and have a fabulous holiday. Yep. You too. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.